Who are you? Mikhail Arkov, Russian Atomic Energy Department. Miss... Mr. Bond. 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 Who is this? The name's Bond. James Bond. Bond. James Bond. Good morning. My name's Bond. James Bond. My name's Bond. James Bond. Bond, James Bond. The name's Bond. James Bond. I am a massive James Bond fan. I grew up with the James Bond franchise. I did grow up in the Pierce Brosnan era, but once I was exposed to Sean Connery, Sean Connery is the definitive James Bond, hands down, hands up. However the phrase is, I think hands down is stupid. Let's just say Sean Connery is the definitive James Bond, period. I've seen most of Sean Connery's uh, James Bond films. I haven't seen all of them. I saw from Russia with Love, which is great. I love the fight uh, sequence on the train. Uh, I saw Dr. No, which is a great movie as well. And I like Sean Connery because I feel like not only is he a handsome man, he, he actually got physical in the role. It's probably a stunt double. But as far as the James Bond, Sean Connery character is concerned, we saw him get physical. We saw that he was very charming. He just had all of the attributes to play James Bond. He was physical. He was charming. He had it all. Then we move on to George Lazenby, who was only in one James Bond movie. I forgot what it's called. But when I found out that Christopher Nolan actually enjoyed George Lazenby's Bond movie, I immediately had to watch it because I didn't watch it before knowing that information. But then I watched it and it's kind of a boring movie. Uh, I really didn't enjoy it all that much. I will say that the ending to that movie, though, is a very sad one. Then from there, we have Roger Moore playing James Bond. And I'm not a fan of the Roger Moore James Bond. Like, I saw A View to a Kill, and that movie's fine. I like Christopher Walken in there. But to me, Roger Moore's James Bond just felt like a satire of James Bond movies. It felt like what Austin Powers did to James Bond. And Roger Moore is playing James Bond as what Austin Powers did. It's like, it's just, just a spoof of what James Bond is, and I don't like that. It d they didn't take it seriously, and Roger Moore's James Bond movies just felt very goofy to me. And from there, we have Timothy Dalton, who plays James Bond, and I actually liked Timothy Dalton's interpretation of Bond. I thought his Bond was very gritty and hardcore. He got physical a lot of the time, and I liked his physicality in the movies. Uh, he played a more serious, straightforward version of Bond. Uh, still had some of that goofiness in it, but so did some of the Sean Connery movies. Um, but with Timothy Dalton, I like Timothy Dalton's portrayal of the character. And, you know, the execution of the stories in there were goofy, but I, I enjoyed Timothy Dalton. Then we get into the era that I grew up in, which is the Pierce Brosnan movies. And... I thought Pierce Brosnan's Bond started off really well. It's like Daniel Craig, you know, it starts off well with GoldenEye. I actually enjoyed Tomorrow Never Dies, and I thought The World Is Not Enough was really good. And then it kind of took a dip, you know, once we got into Die Another Day, which is a silly, goofy movie. But then they did try to redeem themselves with the video game that I played on the PS2 uh, called... Um, I forgot what it's called, but it's a very it was a very good game. They were going to turn that into a movie, but they turned it into a video game. If they would have turned that into a movie, I thought it probably would have been pretty good. But uh, Pierce Brosnan in this Bond, uh, I like Pierce Brosnan in this Bond. He had a little bit of attitude to him, like Timothy Dalton. Uh, Pierce Brosnan is an attractive man. I don't think he's as good looking as Sean Connery was, but... Uh, he, he definitely had, you know, the charm and he had the attitude. 
but it just felt kind of stale. But I would say, you know, in a ranking system, Sean Connery's number one, and then Daniel Craig comes right into second place underneath Sean Connery because Daniel Craig, to me, we have Casino Royale, which is an impressive movie. I remember when Casino Royale first came out, I wasn't looking forward to it because after, you know, Die Another Day, I was like, I'm done with this. And then they came up with Casino Royale and it was very impressive. It was hard hitting. It was intense. Then we have Quantum of Solace, which I think sucks. And then we have Skyfall, which kind of rejuvenated Daniel Craig's Bond. But I, I, I thought Skyfall was a good movie. But it wasn't great. I thought it had some problems. Then we have Spectre, which I think is just it's beautiful to look at. But the narrative is kind of it's just executed in a sloppy way. And so, but I do like Daniel Craig's Bond. That's why I say he comes in number two underneath Sean Connery. Now, apparently the production of this movie has went through a lot of problems. There have been some delays, some firings, or I don't know what you would call it. Just lots of delays. Uh, Bond 25 was scheduled for release on November 2019, but uh, it was pushed back to February 2020. And uh, the reason for this is I guess they have no idea what they want to do with this movie moving forward. They have switched out directors for this movie. Originally, they were going to go with Danny Boyle. And I like Danny Boyle. He did the movie Train Spotting. He has directed uh, some other movies that I've enjoyed. And I like his resume. But for some reason, due to a scheduling conflict, due to uh, negotiations that didn't go correctly, I don't know. Um, but Danny Boyle uh, stepped aside, walked, just decided not to direct this anymore. And now they have hired Kerry Fukunaga, I think his name is. And he is, I think, I think it's a solid choice. I, I don't, I haven't seen Beast of No Nation which is a Netflix uh, movie starring Idris Elba. And when that movie came out, a lot of people said, oh yeah, Beast of No Nation is a really good movie. It's a drama flick and it's kind of gritty, I guess. Um, I heard it was good, but I haven't seen it, so I can't say anything about that. But the, the main thing that excites me about this director is True Detective Season 1. I watched True Detective Season 1 and it's the best thing I've seen on television since Breaking Bad. True Detective Season 1 is very dark, and it's gritty, and it's got good characterization, and I like the narrative in it, the way it's executed it is flawless, and I love, you know, it goes into the past and into the future, and they're telling the story and everything. Like, all of the aspects in True Detective Season 1 are flawless. So that's what makes me excited about Kerry Fukunaga directing Bond 25 is because I feel that if they mix what they did in Quantum of Solace as far as the fighting is concerned, like even though I don't like Quantum of Solace because the narrative is sloppy and the directing is kind of all over the place, the fight sequences in that movie were like Jason Bourne. They were hard hitting, they felt real, and I was impressed. And so if you mix that kind of style and technique into like let's say something that is as lavish and beautiful looking as Skyfall, then I think you have a perfect combination right here where you have a gritty uh, nature to the film, but at the same time it's lavish and it's beautiful. You know, you see violence, but at the same time it's artistic, kind of like what Sam Mendes did in Skyfall with that fight scene. Now immediately, we got to kick things off with the opening gun barrel. It's not a Bond movie if you don't see the opening gun barrel. What the Star Wars opening text is to that franchise, the gun barrel is to the Bond franchise. You got to start it off with the gun barrel. And I think they've been kind of playing with 
the gun barrel and the Daniel Craig Bond movies because in, in Casino Royale they had the opening gun barrel in a very unique uh, setting. They showcased it in a unique way, which I thought was interesting. And then in Quantum of Solace, it didn't appear until the end of the movie. And then in Skyfall, I think it just immediately had an opening scene. There wasn't a gun barrel in there. And in Spectre, I think they did a gun barrel. I don't remember. Um, but you just need to kick it off with the opening gun barrel. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. It's a Bond movie. You need the gun barrel. Just like Star Wars needs its opening text font. I would immediately kick things off showcasing that Bond is officially retired and he has been retired for an extended amount of time. Like I know there's been a thing with these Bond movies where they don't necessarily continue off of the events that happened in a previous movie, but the Daniel Craig Bond movies seem to have broken a lot of the rules established with this franchise and so why stop now? Make this a direct sequel to Spectre. But it doesn't have to be like an immediate sequel. Like we don't need to have Blindfold in this movie. I say they already established who Blindfold is and his relationship to Bond. We don't need to bring him back as the main antagonist here. Because if this is supposed to be, if the Daniel Craig Bond movies are supposed to be, this is how Bond started. If they're supposed to showcase that, then they've already established blindfold and so then moving forward when you watch you know the roger moore bond movies we see blindfold and bond's relationship and how it ends so we don't need to bring blindfold back here we already showed him and established him so let's move on from that what i'm saying is is that in the, at the end of the specter movie bond drove off into the sunset with madeline swan and pick up from there because if we just kick this movie off with bond on a mission and he's doing things it would be kind of confusing because then it's like wait a minute didn't this dude retire and then drive off into the sunset well, how did he get here you know it doesn't make any sense and so i would say pick it pick it up from that but have it be you know a couple years later you know i would say at least seven you have it be at least seven years later an extended amount of time to where Bond has grown a full beard and he he's a woodsman. He lives in the woods with uh, Madeline Swan and they live in isolation and solitude and showcase that Bond is very happy with his lifestyle. He's become, you know, kind of like a family man. They don't have any kids or anything, but, you know, he lives there and he chops wood and he cooks dinner and they make love and they drink wine and they sit in front of the fire and tell stories and all this stuff. Like, I would say showcasing Bond in this light will show a different side of Bond, show him being tender, show him being in love and infatuated with this woman, right? Give us a reason as to why Bond truly wants to be with her, right? You know, she's very sweet, she's kind, and she clearly loves him too. Show them being together, you know? But don't like brush over it, like what they did in um, Skyfall. Like in Skyfall, they showed Bond, you know, being retired and the only thing he was doing was drinking. And then, you know, MI6 got attacked and then that brought, that brought Bond back. Don't do it like that and don't rush it. You need to milk this, okay? You need to milk their relationship. You need to show it, show it for at least five or ten minutes, right? As other stuff is going on. Like, we need to showcase that, yeah, Bond is happy where he's at. He's happy being retired. So it'd be a mix between, you know, kind of like what Nicolas Cage was doing in the movie Mandy with that woman who played Mandy. Something like that. You know, show that with a little bit of mix of, you know, Bond when he was with Vesper, you know, he, he apparently Bond has retired twice with women that he's fallen in love with. And so this time he's settled, you know, he's grown a full beard. He's a, he's a mountain man now. He's a man of the woods now. And he's a, he's officially retired and he's satisfied. So you got to showcase that. You know, and have it be loving and endearing and tender and beautiful, you know, and a lot of people probably be pissed about that. Like, this isn't a Bond movie. Well, this is the new Bond, and this is where Bond is in his life right now. Make it feel like a happy moment in Bond's life. Like, well, finally Bond has some solitude and peace, and he's in love, and it's great. 
So just show that at the very beginning of the movie. But then, of course, living in James Bond's world, nothing truly lasts forever, especially love. Just look at his past. So something has to bring Bond back. Something has to bring him out of retirement. Something big and crucial to his existence has to bring him back, right? And I don't know what that would be. I would suggest that Let's say Tanner, right, who has been a loyal friend to Bond through from Casino Royale leading to here. And since Bond is retired, you know, we have some new field operatives. Tanner's helping them out. We have Q's helping them out, all this stuff. And we should have like an opening action scene where we have Tanner in the field and he's helping out the new agents and they're trying to, you know, do something, a mission. But then the mission goes to shit and Tanner gets killed. And when Tanner gets killed, there's this big threat that the MI6 can't stop. And it's such a big threat that for some reason, I don't know what it would be, but for some reason they have to bring Bond back. So having Tanner die would bring Bond back because that's Tanner is a close friend to him. I wouldn't say they're super close, but they're pretty close. They know each other to where they trust each other. So then, like, if Tanner dies, a, a character who's been in all of the Daniel Craig Bond movies, that's an important character. You kill an important character who's close to Bond. Because I feel like if they kill just some character who we just met in this movie and that brings Bond back, that won't make any sense. Like, kind of what they did in Skyfall. Like, some random character died and Bond cares about him. He's like, I can't leave him. It's like... That makes sense, but if we kill someone who's close to him, then we're like, we're off to the races here. And it's more believable that someone who actually knows Bond in a personal way dies. So that brings him back. But then I could also say that Madeline Swan should tempt Bond just a little bit to bring him back. Like at first, you know, Bond is presented with this information like, oh, Tanner's dead. And they need me to come back to MI6, but I'm happy here. Yeah, Tanner was my friend, but I'm happy here, and I don't want to get back into that. So Bond should be a little hesitant at first. But then Madeline Swan, you know, sprinkles some some insight into Bond's consciousness and says, well, you know, why don't, why don't you just see what they want, you know? Like, just, just find out what they want, see what's going on, and, you know, that was your friend, you know, you want to avenge him, and we'll get to why Madeline Swan will be tempting Bond later. Now, on top of all that, we need a female antagonist. We need a female antagonist, because throughout the history of Bond, from the very beginning, Every female that is in Bond's life has been treated pretty much like shit. He slaps women, he abuses them mentally, physically, just to get information from them. And then he tosses them to the side. My turn. I win. What do you say to that? A waste of good scotch. What the fuck? That is fucked up. And as of right now, we really haven't gotten to that version of Bond yet. We kind of have, but we really haven't gone all the way there. And I remember when I was talking to a friend of mine about James Bond, she told me, you know, I don't really like James Bond because he's very misogynistic and the representation of women in a Bond movie isn't something that I would like to see. And I agree with that. I understand that completely. So it would be good to have a female antagonist in here just to have, you know, finally within this franchise, a female who's, rep who's represented as a perfect adversary to Bond. Have this female antagonist be smarter than Bond. Have it be like what the Joker is to Batman, this female antagonist, is just as good if not better than bond himself and then on top of that having to be a female antagonist 
Madeline Swan can have some sort of relationship to this female antagonist. So therefore, I feel like that kind of um, illustrates why Madeline Swan sprinkled some ideas within Bond's consciousness to come back into the fray of things and why we have a female antagonist. So they have a direct connection to each other. So at first, you know, Bond and the audience will think, oh, you know, it's just some personal stakes involved, you know, world domination, I need to stop this. Oh, it just happens to be a female. But then, you know, as the story progresses, we can learn that this female antagonist has some sort of past dispute with Madeline Swan that she wants to correct. And so therefore, you know, that will draw some tension between Bond and Madeline Swan. And then Bond will be like, you brought me here. Now I can't trust you anymore. But then Madeline Swan can be like, nah, I know that I told you these things, but I really still do love you. But this female antagonist is the reason why I brought you back here so you can help me get her and take her down because of something that happened in our past. So yeah, just have a female antagonist just to showcase that, yeah, there is a female in this world who is mentally stronger than Bond himself. And then it's going to be difficult for Bond to overcome this because number one, it's a female. And then number two, Madeline Swan is also involved in this. And Madeline Swan and the female antagonist have a personal vendetta that Bond is just pretty much stuck in the middle of. Every Bond movie pretty much has the main henchman. We had it in From Russia With Love. We've had it in Goldfinger. We've had it with the Jaws character. We've had it in pretty much every Bond movie. We had it in Spectre with Dave Bautista. It's been in pretty much every Bond movie. The henchman who fights Bond and usually ends up getting their ass whooped. I would say that we should have a henchman who can go toe to toe with Bond and kick his ass. Bond should be up against the greatest limits of his life because he's been retired for so long. He's a bit rusty, kind of like what they did in Skyfall when he was gone for a little while, he comes back and then he doesn't know how to shoot correctly, which side note, this is one of the problems I had with Skyfall, which it wasn't a great movie because yeah, the movie does illustrate that he has a problem with his targeting, but then there's a scene where he shoots people in quick succession. And it really bothered me. It baffled me. Like, wait a minute. Just a minute ago, you didn't know how to shoot. And now you're killing these people with ease. And that really bothered me. So that's why I say Skyfall is like a good movie, but it's not great. There was some story development problems that I had with that. But in this, if they showcase that, okay, Bond, you know, he's got his, he, he's a happy man living in the woods. And then Tanner gets killed. And they bring him back and now his ego is getting large but at the same time he's in love and he wants to protect madeline but madeline wants to help him then he discovers all the, the there's a female antagonist and she's smarter than me she outsmarts me and all of these schemes then we have the henchman who immediately disposes of bond right like we should have multiple instances in this movie where the henchmen and Bond, they have a fight. And just like Bane and Batman, the henchmen immediately dispatches of Bond physically. And then later on in the movie, they meet and Bond gets beat up again. So not only do we have a female antagonist who outsmarts Bond, but we have a henchman who just completely whoops Bond's ass, right? And that would be great. That'd be great to see Bond get his ass whooped physically and mentally so therefore he has a challenge that he has to overcome right and the henchmen should be so damn near close to killing bond each time they get in the confrontation that bond has to use his gadgets just to get out of the situation and then when bond gets out of the situation he just runs away because he's like i can't beat this guy so then later on you know towards the end of the movie when bond finally you know, goes through some more training or something, and then he, you know, develops his mind and develops his body and all this and stuff. He can finally come back and, and beat the henchman's ass and whatnot and overcome the female antagonist. 
But for starters, we should definitely have that henchman who can go toe to toe with Bond. And my suggestion would be someone like Tony Ja or somebody, you know, someone who really doesn't have to say anything. They can just be there and kick Bond's ass a couple times. And then towards the end, you know, Bond beats him and whatnot. But definitely have a henchman who can kick Bond's ass. That would be a plus. Madeline Swan has to die to give Bond more motivation moving forward in the movie and in the franchise as a whole. Bond should not retire with a love interest anymore after this. It should be over with because this is, if we saw it the first time in Casino Royale when he retired with Vesper and she betrayed him, and then we saw it again in Spectre. And in my movie, in my interpretation of what I think Bond 25 should be, he retires again and this should be the end of it. And the reason why I think Madeline Swan should die is because unlike Vesper, uh, Madeline Swan is 100% loyal. She hasn't betrayed Bond, she hasn't set him up, she just didn't tell him about the female antagonist and her entanglement with her, you know? So at first Bond doesn't trust her, but then Madeline Swan convinces her loyalty to him and goes up against the female antagonist and explains what the past situation was between her and the antagonist. I don't know what that would be, but just something that, you know, is drastic to her and the reason why she brought Bond back and why Bond would want to help her. So I would say have Madeline Swan, you know, be have her be that woman that Bond truly loves, right? So at the beginning, we see their relationship and how beautiful it is. And then during, you know, the beginning of the second act, it's or, or at the end of the first act, in the beginning of the second act, have that reveal of, yeah, the female antagonist knows Madeline Swan. Madeline Swan knows the female antagonist. They have some sort of past. Bond gets upset, doesn't trust Madeline Swan for a moment, but then she does something that ultimately brings Bond back to trusting her. She could sacrifice herself in some sort of way where she dies for Bond. And in that very moment when she dies, it could be like Bond finally opening his eyes like, yeah, he'll, he'll never find a true love. He'll never be in love again. So with her dying and him not, and those two not being in any bad position, it illustrates that, yeah, he had that one true love. She sacrificed herself for him and she died. And this is the last straw. So then moving forward in the franchise after Bond 25 is over, we have our definitive Bond who goes back to being misogynistic because he doesn't want to get his heart broken. And so that will perfectly illustrate who Bond is and why, why he is the way he is moving forward. It's like he found that one true love again she died again but this time it was on good terms and now he feels like i'll never find love again so therefore i'm just going to be a misogynistic bastard and treat women as disposable pleasantries so her dying in here would make sense moving forward and on top of that if this is how bond started we got madeline swan in here i don't think there's a madeline swan character in the other installments of the series so her living doesn't make any sense, but so Judy Dench didn't make any sense either. But trying to keep in continuity, we have to kill Madeline Swan here because she doesn't appear in any other Bond movies. So we kill her here, give her a definitive death, and then therefore that will illustrate who Bond is moving forward in the franchise. And we'll finally have our definitive misogynistic bastard named James Bond. I will say just as a suggestion for what the opening theme should be, uh, I don't know what it should be, but if I were the executive producer of this, I would totally hire Solomon Gray to do the theme for Bond 25 just because of Solomon Gray's music. Like if you listen to Solomon Gray's music, it has a lot of depth to it. 
It has a lot of emotion to it. His voice is fantastic. It sounds atmospheric. And I just love Solomon Gray's music. I think he has the perfect tone for this. Just everything about this guy's music is fantastic. And I think having him do the theme will be truly tremendous for Bond 25. Now, I know a lot of rumors have been going around where they say they should bring Adele back and all this. And Adele, I love the Skyfall theme. And Adele makes great music. But we've been there, done that. Please don't bring somebody back. You need to make this new and fresh. And I think Solomon Gray needs a lot of exposure because this guy's music is fucking awesome. And of course, we have our usual aesthetic in here we have our lavish locations the Q gadgets we have to bring Q's gadgets back because I know what Spectre tried to do and it was pretty impressive it was I like the way they did it you know where they have the gadgets in here but they're malfunctioning clever but we need to like move away like I know they want to make Bond realistic but Bond is known for his gadgets right just like Q said to Bond in the old James Bond movies. If it hadn't been for Q, Branch, you'd have been dead long ago. So we need to have the Q gadgets in here. And I don't think we should go overboard with it. We should definitely uh, have the gadgets in here, but keep them to a minimum. I'm not talking like Skyfall minimal. Have enough in here to make it feel like this is a Bond movie and we do have some nice gadgets in here. I would say make it a personal story, not too personal like Spectre to where it gets silly and convoluted. Um, just, I would say make it a personal story between Madeline Swan, Bond, and the female antagonist. Like I said, Madeline Swan has a personal vendetta with the main villain. The main villain has a personal vendetta with Madeline Swan. Bond is just caught in the middle of that. And then he tries to save Madeline, but then Madeline ends up dying. So now Bond is pissed at the female antagonist because number one, she outsmarts Bond. Number two, they killed Tanner. Number three, they killed his number two true love. And so that just sets Bond off and he can go berserk at the end of the movie, just wiping people out left and left and right. And with the female antagonist, by the end, when he finally foils the female antagonist plan, I don't know if he should kill her or let her live. My personal feeling would be that he should kill the female antagonist. Because when I think about that, on top of that, that will further cement what Bond thinks of women and why he is the way he is in the franchise. I feel like it works perfectly within Bond's structure as a character moving forward because we definitely need to get back to who Bond is and it's taken forever to get there and this is the last installment to showcase how Bond came to be give us good reasons as to why Bond is the way he is have it be the best Bond movie the best Daniel Craig Bond movie given us that hard hitting gritty action with the lavish locations with female characters who are important and they mean something to the story and a villain who can beat bond in a physical manner and in a mental state where bond is completely broken to where he has to rebuild himself in a slow process don't have it happen too quickly like what they did in Skyfall. Don't rush over his retirement like what they did in Skyfall. Don't have him fall in love again like they did twice already. Just have this be like, okay, this is how Bond came to be. And this is the definitive illustration of how Bond came to be. So that by the end of the movie, we see Bond's cuts and bruises. Not only on him physically, but within his heart. So that by the end of the movie, he's just completely stone cold. You think of women as disposable pleasures rather than meaningful pursuits. And he has forever been changed by what has happened in his life to where now we have the bond that we know and love. And now we can move on 
and get rid of Daniel Craig and bring someone else into this and have a whole new take on Bond. And hopefully that's what they do. And that's all I have to say. So as always, thank you for watching and I will talk to you next time.